This is Simon Brody from Drowning Man, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. This is Keith. And Tommy. And we are back once again with a brand new episode. And folks, tonight on the show, Michael Burdan of Uniform. You know, usually I go into a little bit of detail about how the conversation went and some stuff here, but this one took a very surprising turn, a very pleasantly surprising turn. It was a great conversation, and that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else to add with this. This is one of those ones where... We have notes set out for, you know, to talk for an hour or so, and we used about three of those notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just a great conversation. Yeah. Great conversation with a great individual from a great band. So strap in, you're going to really like it. And folks, Tommy lied to me right before we started recording. I was like, are you ready? And he's like, yes. And then he's like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to hit start. And then he's like, wait, I have to plug in my phone. And I was like, okay. And he's like, wait, I have to get some water. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, all right, now are you ready? And then he's like, yes. And I'm like, do you have audacity running? And he's like, no. <laughs> this uh, Keep in mind, this all happened in the span of about 15 seconds. <laughs> so you have to dig with Tommy. You, you never know if what he's telling you is the exact truth. Oh, really? We're going to get into it? Okay. I mean, that seems... <laughs> uh, uh, th- let's be honest. That seems like incredibly petty. But... I'm just I'm just stirring up trouble here for our enjoyment. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> so folks, enough torturing poor Tommy. I'm here to remind you that we are in week 4 of the New Scene Charity Drive. Now, here's what we need. Apple Podcast reviews and Spotify reviews. Now, I have checked the other podcasts and they have hundreds hundreds of reviews. And folks, I'm going to keep asking you until we get over 100 reviews. Now, thank you for everyone who has submitted a review so far. They are coming in. We are getting closer. So keep them coming. Open up your Apple Podcast or Spotify app. Scroll down to the review section. You have to scroll down a little bit in Apple Podcast to get to it. In Spotify, it's right up at the top. Give us a five-star review. And if you write a nice review, we'll read it on the air. We're going to read a couple more at the end of the show. Also, we have a shirt. We have a shirt available for sale. Hit the link in our social media bios. The new scene, Life is Music is Life, long sleeve shirt, is available now for purchase, and they are shipping soon, so get yours now. Where are we in terms of the numbers? Like, it's, So we want 100. Where, like, uh, are we like a third of the way there? Are we like 50%? Where are we? I don't want to reveal that. Okay, fair out enough. of shame and <laughs> disappointment. Okay, in the fact. Fe- now I think we're at like sixty. Oh, okay. We're getting closer. That's solid. Sixty people. Yeah, getting sixty people to do something that costs them their own time. Like uh, that's not bad. Well, let's not give the audience too much credit because <laughs> there were some existing reviews. We've had a decent amount come in, but we need more. We need your participation, folks. This is your time to shine. <laughs> a little E-Town reference. <laughs> <laughs> I Look, I'll work in an E-Town reference whenever I can, believe me. But Tommy, Tommy, do you know what we're going to do next? Uh, I do. Folks, it's time for Tommy's favorite segment. <music> the Pop Culture Minute. And this is where we discuss the important top issues of the day who's in who's out who's canceled who's not we're gonna get into it right now tommy are you ready now tommy your boy kanye west is in all kinds of trouble the the saga with him and ex-wife i don't know if they're actually divorced kim kardashian continues kanye has been on a tear on social media posting avengers memes that he had someone make with him going up against Pete Davidson. He's posting text conversations with Pete Davidson, where he's saying, you're never going to meet my children. He's posting text conversations with Kim. He has 
made some threats against Pete, or Skeet, as he calls him. And then he recalled all of those threats and, you know, backed up on everything he said and said that he's learning and growing and he apologized and all of this stuff. So, Tommy, you are a avid Kanye West fan. Give me your thoughts on this. I have a hard time with this because I think there's a there's a weird line between Kanye is at times exhibits things that look like mental illness. And then there's other times where he does shit on purpose to look like he's crazy. <laughs> like, and I think drawing the line between where is like real mental illness and him being outlandish for being just to get the coverage. I think it also doesn't hurt that Donda two is coming out and is well is out and uh, it, it's kind of ramping up towards that. I think, uh, All press is good press at this point for him, and I think he knows that. Yeah, I feel for Kanye because, you know, losing the mother of your children in a breakup or divorce or whatever it is, and, you know, she's having a very public relationship with guy of the moment, Pete Davidson, that's got to hurt. I mean, that's got to hurt. Yeah, especially when you see that dude. I, I, (laughs) he just looks like, uh, he just looks like a broken person, like, you know, from like the Island of Misfit Toys, that kind of thing. Like, he just doesn't seem like he's well put together and he kind of seems like uh, maybe that's the appeal of him. But uh, yeah, Kanye's like, you know, a good looking dude. He got his shit together sometimes. <laughs> like he's, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, sometimes he's got it together. Uh, but, you know, yeah, that has to that has to sting, especially if it was like, you know, if she left and was like with Jada Kiss, I'd be like, all right, that makes sense. Or like the game, like okay, cool, all right. That I, Pete Davidson is like a weird looking dude from Staten Island. Like, <laughs> I, I just, I, I, I don't get it. But at the same time, like, look, that that lady makes crazy decisions all the time. So I mean, yeah, I feel for Kanye, but the public way that he is handling this, posting text conversations and making threats and all of that, it is not the way to go. It is not the way to go. It never benefits you, the person doing it. You just got to kind of suck it up and live your best life, as difficult as that can be. And that's what I have to say about it. Now, Tommy, you mentioned Donda 2. Donda 2 will only be available via the Stem Player. Now, Kanye has created this. It has the album. It is available for $200. So you got to pay $200 to get the new Kanye album through this Stem Player. Now, let me let me comment on this. I think this is great because... Artists don't get the majority of the money they generate. Record companies get it, and Spotify has created a trust with all of the record companies where all of the money that the artists generate funnel into the record companies and Spotify. The artists make nothing unless they're touring and selling merchandise. It's a crappy system. It is a bad platform for that reason. And Kanye is circumventing that, and successfully so, apparently, there, I read an article where he has made $2.2 million from sales of this stem player. So that's $2.2 million, uh, I guess, circumventing the record companies and streaming services, which is fantastic. He's made $2.2 million, And it, it, how much does it cost? $200? Yes. So he sold about 11,000 copies of, the rec- of this stem player then. I am going to trust your math skills on that and say yes. But I mean, so you're, this is my point. I think you're in the right on this, especially if the, the I don't know much about STEM. Does it support other, or other music uh, artists going to be able to be available through STEM? So like if you buy STEM, you can just play the Kanye album or can you play other things? I don't think it's, I think this is specific to Kanye and his album. I don't think this is a new platform for everyone. All right, well, let's say he was making $10 an album from the ones he sold, right? He'd have to sell 220,000 copies to make the same amount of money. Well, that's ridiculous. That's the thing. So he, I think he's totally in the right with this. Like that makes so much more sense because even if you get, you know, it's not even a penny, right? Like for streaming services, like you get less than a penny. It's like 0.009 cents or something like that. You'd have to literally look at like 30, 40, 50 million streams to get even close to getting to that type of money. So I think this is an excellent choice for him. I think if people are willing to pay the $200 for the album, I know I'm not. Uh, (laughs) But, you know, God bless him. Good for him. And I hope this works out. I hope this is a future thing that kind of 
other artists start to kind of take advantage of and look at it as like, look, if I open my own thing and sell it the way I want to sell it, then I don't have to deal with the revenue. You know, I don't have to deal with the recoup stuff from record companies and shit. There you go. Also, Tommy Soldier Boy had commentary on the ongoing Kanye West troubles. Listen to this. Oh, Lord. Kanye, wake up. Skeet got your bitch, nigga. What you gonna do? Is you gonna peep, keep posting memes of Marvel versus Capcom? <laughs> <laughs> or you gonna lay the smack down? Lame ass nigga, fuck you talking about. So fuck you get, nigga. <laughs> nigga tried to play me. Nigga, you know who the fuck I'm is? I'm Big Draco. Now you running around Hollywood crying like a bitch. <gasps> Oh, boy. Oh, help me. Fuck you, Kanye. <laughs> Yikes. Ouch. Isn't Soldier Boy kind of a dork, though, too? Like, he kind of got punked a bunch of different times, and people called him out on stuff that he was like, I do this, and I can, you know, I th- the big one was like, I travel in a, a private jet, and then, like, you could clearly see he was, like, <laughs> he was in a regular, like, business class seat in a in a plane. I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know much about him, but I saw this video and apparently uh, Kanye texted Soldier Boy and said never to mention him again. And then there were some more oh uh, unkind words exchanged. But then I saw another article that said everything was cool and they worked it out. So uh, who knows? Who knows what's going on? But folks, that is it. That is the Pop Culture Minute, where we deliver you the latest and greatest news whenever we feel like it. See, Tommy, I think you were okay with this one because it's stuff that you are kind of interested in. Oh, yeah. No, and I like that this one uh, tangentially kind of involved math. So I like that. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Well, folks, strap in because right now we are going to speak to Mike Berdan of Uniform. Enjoy. All right, folks, we're here now with Mike Berdan. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You got to tell us, how are you doing today? Today? Um, you know, that's, uh, that's, an, uh, that's a broad question. I, I'm, I'm overall doing well. Uh, it's, uh, had, a, had a quiet day hanging out with uh, my two silly dogs, uh, patching up a uh, modular synthesizer and watch... Catching up on Ozark and uh, watching uh, other uh, kind of uh, assorted garbage slasher movies in the background. So not so bad. Uh, I'm on the East Coast, and we were supposed to practice at 11 p.m. tonight. And it, I realized what going to – I wake up at 6.30 in the morning every morning. And, and, you know, we're getting ready for this tour. So it's like, oh, yeah, like squeeze in practices whenever we can. Everybody kind of works. Everybody's got different schedules. The thing that we could do is 11 o'clock tonight. And, you know, shortly before, uh, before I talked to you guys, I, you know, I looked and I stared at the, uh, at the 11 o'clock. Um, and, uh, I just, this is unacceptable. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I would rather be bad on tour than be a 41 year old man going to band practice at 11 PM. <laughs> Yeah, I'm 40 years old, and get I, my band usually practices on Saturdays, and I'm at the age where I can only schedule one thing in the day now. So it's like, if we're having band practice, I can't do anything else. So band practice at 11 p.m. sounds crazy. Terror. I, I mean, I've never actually done it before. We've had band practice at 11 p.m. scheduled for the past three Thursdays, and each week... One of us kind of comes up with an excuse to not do it. And this week I finally broke it. I was like, you know what? My excuse is that I don't want to. Uh, I like, I understand that we have to do it at certain times. 9 p.m. is my cutoff. 9 p.m. is grown up, but like fine, like end of the rope, making time, band practice. We can do 9 p.m. Six, I wake up at 6 30. No way. <laughs> Isn't it funny that a uh, chess game of band practice scheduling that happens sometimes? I just stepped off the cliff the other week and I was like, you know what? I, I just can't. I didn't even give a reason. I just I just really didn't want to. It was snowing. 
and I didn't feel like going out in the snow. So I just, I just said that I can't. Yeah. I mean, fuck it. You Sometimes you, it's like, it's one thing to be like, you know, physically capable. It's another thing to be emotionally willing. And if you're not emotionally willing, the spiritual or the physically capable, just like, it doesn't fucking matter. I would rather just not go than go and have a bad time. Like, you know, that I, I get those people who are like, you know, just just do it. Like, you know, if you do it, like you won't regret it. It's like it's billable hours. I don't feel that way anymore. I, w- I was like that as a kid. <laughs> I was like that, you know, in, in my 20s. Now it's like if I don't want to go, then I will be at this space just thinking about how much I hate being there. And, <laughs> like, and, and I'm like and, I, and then shit gets deeply existential and uh, I, I'd, I'd rather I would rather save those like what am I doing with my life questions for like you know 3 p.m in a van somewhere in Nebraska like I, yeah. I, I don't need that when I'm coming home to my wife and my dogs you should have kids it's a phenomenal excuse to never go anywhere fuck that <laughs> <laughs> I, but that that's the thing is like I look I Kids are fine. Kids are great. They're cute. They're, they're, they're sweet. They're very, very funny. Um, I barely figured out how to wipe my own ass at this point. <laughs> uh, the, like, let alone the, like the, me being responsible for a life is like, which like, there are two like living things sitting at my feet right now. I'm one of those dickheads who talks about their dogs too much. I'm entirely sorry about that um but it's like okay like you know i've got these like these these little things and you know that's hard enough child means like damn i'm never going on tour again and oh my god like i think about me where it's like yo i was 12 and smoking pcp like am i gonna (laughs) fucking like i deserve the worst kid like i deserve like you know i was like you know i was like you know in and out of fucking like you, you know like my like my local like fucking you know holding cell jail type thing. All the cops knew me. All the cops, you know, felt bad for my mom. Yada yada. I, I deserve so much worse. So like, yeah, no, I'm just gonna fucking have dogs and like watch TV. <laughs> so you smoked PCP at 12 years old? Yes, I, I grew up outside of Philadelphia. Oh, oh, where? Where at? Uh, I grew up in Upper Darby. Oh well, that explains it. Okay. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Do you, are, you, are you guys familiar with the area? Oh yeah, we we grew up in Bucks County, and I lived in Philly for nine years. Oh shit! Oh fuck! Fantastic! Uh, uh, that well, welcome. Uh, welcome to <laughs> welcome to all of us. Um, do you do you guys live in Bucks County right now? Tommy lives in Bucks County. I live in Brooklyn. Oh shit! Uh, where where? Okay, Tommy, where in Bucks County are you? I'm like right. I'm about a mile away from uh, Parks Casino in Ben Salem. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and Keith, where, where are you in Brooklyn? Williamsburg. Okay. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm in bed Ah, I, I lived in bed for a while, like three years, four years. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I lived in Williamsburg for, you know, the longest time. And, uh, you know, eventually it just kind of, you know, uh, there, there was a fire in my building that, uh, you know, kind of, kind of chased us out and uh after the fact we, could, we couldn't yeah you know we just didn't kind of have the time uh or the money to kind of you know go digging at that uh at that time for williamsburg greenpoint real estate but i i miss it over there uh i i, I miss uh i miss my pizza spots on graham avenue which one uh i you know i uh i i was uh polyamorous when it came to those um i would carmine's Carmine's if I wanted a specialty slice, if I wanted just yes. a, if I wanted a plain slice, Tony's. Okay. Yeah, Tony, I I guess I'm never in the mood for a plain slice because I go to Tony's and I'm like, this is what people are talking about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's it's standard, like, you know, like New York pizza fair. And yeah, you know, yeah, like I like, like, that's the kind of thing that like, you know, like, when I first moved here, it like blew my mind. Now it's just kind of one of those like, you know, eh, I wouldn't kick it out of bed, but, um, you know, eh, eh, I, I miss having the access to just like go to, like, you know, I, I lived off the Graham Avenue L, uh, forever. And, uh, I miss having the access of just walking up to either one and being like, you know, I was on first name basis with uh, the people behind the counters at both of them. So, um, uh, you know, and I, I'm, I'm not like that where I am in bad, in bed which kind of sucks. 
Yeah, I I love this neighborhood and I will stay as long as I can. If I ever get moved out of this place, I'm going to be priced out and I'm going to have to move somewhere else. So I'm like dug in here. And I lived in bed too. And I left because all my roommates left because someone was stabbed and killed directly in front of our building. Ooh, that's not good. Yeah. 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 That's not that's not good at all. Where where in bed was that? Shit, I can't even remember. It's, it was close to like the Jay Halsey stop where that Rite Aid is. I know exactly where you're talking about. Yeah, it's not it's not the greatest part of town. No, I mean, that's the thing. It's like people get this idea that New York is like, you know, entirely sanitized. And, you know, in some ways, like, you know, it like th- they've they've taken a lot of the fun out of uh, out of New York. Like you can't you know, necessarily go to like the same shows, the same spaces, the same galleries, the same bars, the same movies, but like New York's still New York, man. Like I I think about how expensive it is around like the Myrtle's stop on the J and it's like, there's a, you know, there's a fucking methadone clinic, like right there, you know? (laughs) And, And like, like you get out there and like, you know, they're like, you know, like they're fucking, you know, junkies like down to do junkie shit man i hope i don't like make a bunch of people mad but hey uh guess what i used to do a lot of drugs so i'm allowed to say this <laughs> like, oh we're gonna talk about that too me too oh fantastic oh the best yeah mike have you been back to upper darby recently <laughs> okay here's the shit with that okay so <laughs> sorry i don't want to uh, like if that's a sore spot but <laughs> no 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 it's like a fuck it, it, it's it's it, i mean it's the the worst place in the world but uh you know i i'm, I'm also like very like in love and proud of it and you know it's kind of like if somebody talks shit about like you can run your mouth about your mom but if like somebody else runs their mouth about your mom like it's just not okay it's a problem yeah. yeah exactly like don't fucking like I, i'm not gonna say anything bad about my mom okay? she listens. <laughs> hi mom i love you um I'll, I'll say it about my dad. My dad's dead. So, okay. Yeah. Fuck my dad. My dad's a piece of shit. Um, but yeah, somebody else goes like, yeah, your dad's a piece of shit. I go like, how dare you talk about my father that way? He's dead. Like I, I, I you, you've deeply offended me. Um, but anyway, whatever upper Darby, I have not been back for a while because, um, my mother within the past couple of years remarried and moved out to Montgomery County. She lives in Ambler now. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, she's fucking like, God bless you, mom. God bless you, Steve. You guys did well. You are fancy now, and that's wonderful. I'm very happy for you guys. Um, and my little brother, who had stayed in the Drexel Hill area for a while, he is now in Broomall. So when I come to town, like, I don't even go to Philly anymore. I usually just, like, yeah, I'm either in Ambler or Broomall, which is like, very very fucking strange tell us about growing up in upper darby now it sounds like you had a pretty wild childhood i mean like yes and no i don't think i had like a wilder childhood than like most people there um i mean i didn't smoke pcp at 12 years old (laughs) well okay so that I'll, i'll i'll give a little background in that for a little bit so you know my my family moved to like, you know, like Drexel Hill, Upper Darby area. When I was four, we moved from, uh, from Boston and, uh, my dad split like a couple of months after that and yada, yada, he wound up landing in New York. So it was just me my mom and my brother in like, you know, the early eighties, uh, around here. And, you know, I was like, this lonely, awkward kid who like, you know, kind of got like, you know, really into fucking like, you know, horror movies and Stephen King. And then, you know, started watching the headbangers ball and like, you know, ruined my life. Um, but I like, if you know the areas I was like, when I was a, uh, like, yeah, like sixth grade, um, like, uh, a, uh, I, I was like, yeah, I was 12, sixth grade. Um, I would hang out at Bond Park, Bond, uh, Bond Avenue field. Everybody, like everybody, you know, fucking suburban living, like everybody hangs out in fucking parks and like, you know, gangs are situated around like parks and like 
areas like within a park that like you can and can't like hang out in anyway like i hung out at bond park and that's where all of like you know the kind of like you know rugged kids would hang out and their older brothers and all these guys older brothers like the other like kind of like bad kids sixth graders they were part of this like this motorcycle ish gang kind of skinhead gang called the hammers not like not like hammer skins ac skins or whatever like there were some skinheads but these were like these were just like upper darby white trash and those guys would like you know uh think that it was funny to like you know just get kids real fucking high in bunch of like real weird ways and um you know like we like we were just like we were just assholes and there was uh you know there was a tremendous amount of violence um you know it was one of those those neighborhoods where like you know kids just like beat the shit out of each other like um around around that part and it's it's funny i i got away from that like you know quote unquote got away from that when i was like you know, 15, 16. And I started going to punk shows and, uh, you know, kind of like got clean for the first time. Well, let's talk about that. Now you got clean for the first time around 16. Yeah. 15, 16. What were you doing at the time and how did you stop? Did you, did just going to shows and getting into that kind of steer you in the right direction? I was just around different people. And, uh, yeah, you know, like I, I mean, at that point I, it was mostly like, you know, fucking like weed and pills and drinking and then like whatever uppers I could find in like, you know, whatever medicine cabinets, like, you know, fucking like, you know, just like crushing up garbage and uh, like, yeah, in my 20s, if you had a prescription of Adderall XR in your in your medicine cabinet, it was some of it was going to be gone for sure. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was I I was into that. But, you know, it it kind of I had some like, you know, kind of like mm, not like major like minor pretty minor consequences where like i got arrested uh breaking into if, if uh, describing the the neighborhood if you uh if you remember like the rock quarry next to clover which turned into coals with the pizza like whatever off of route one the fucking the quarry um you know my friends and i used to kind of like sneak in there and like just like you know act like assholes anyway got busted going in there and like you know i had like a bunch of stuff like something on me i have like probably probably weed or something but you know that was like you know my first kind of like you know whatever like judge cops what um judge was like you know like yeah like you know this will be expunged and you'll be cool and you don't have to do community service or anything if you uh you know good like you know this kind of counseling and so i was like yeah fine fuck it i'm already going to punk shows so and like my friends don't like you know they don't party so fine cool like so i i you know i kept on smoking cigarettes but um besides that like i uh you know i really cleaned up my act tell us about your early show going experiences. What grabbed you? Where were you going to shows? Uh, I would go to shows at the Speakeasy Cafe uh, a lot, and then there were, you know, a couple of other spots, or uh, um, you know, around the area, like the Drexel Hill Baptist Church, and um, you know, kind of uh, some other stuff like that. I remember uh, we would go out to uh, to Norristown to uh, the Sapphire Nightclub and. Uh, you know, we'd see, uh, like, you know, all else failed and I hate you there. And, uh, yes. and, uh, that would be, uh, that would be a blast. Uh, but then, you know, I pretty quickly started going to Philly to, uh, Stalag 13 and that, became, yes. yeah. And that, that was like my like very real home base from, you know, I'd say like 96 until it closed. Um, and you know, I, I stayed, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still really tight with everybody from, from that world. Uh, that was, that was my like, you know, real kind of intro into, um, uh, into punk. Wow. We have very similar stories. I like this. Yeah. Were, were, were you a Stalag kid? Oh yeah. I was there. Kill time. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. 
the other place a little bit. What was it? 4040 or Rotunda, all that stuff. Yep, 4040 and Rotunda. Uh, how do you feel about the band Ink and Dagger? Uh, ha, 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 ha. I, uh, complicated? Um, <laughs> no, no, you know what? Not actually, not even that fucking complicated. Uh, I, 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 I think they're brilliant. I think that they're the only band that ever uh, attempted to sound like Swizz and pulled it off. Um, you know, they like obviously, like you know, like the like the first two uh, seven inches are like you know um, classic. I, I'm cool with the full lengths. Um, uh, it's it's funny um, when I was a lot younger, uh, me and Ch- I was a lot skinnier uh, then, um, and uh, I had a, like a, a whatever haircut, and I me and uh and their singer sean mccabe um traveled in similar circles and we um we looked a lot alike and i would often get in trouble for shit that he would do and <laughs> like, like you know like he'd like you know pick a fight or be like an asshole to somebody's girlfriend or like you know whatever and like i'd get yelled at for it I'm like what the fuck are you talking about um and uh that pretty much happened until he died and um but yeah, I I love Ink and Dagger. I I I I I don't know any fucking red blooded uh you know Philadelphian Delcoin who like came out of that time period who could like I mean they they're they're to this day like one of the best live bands I've ever seen like possibly the best live band I've ever seen like yes like I mean I understand people not from the area not really getting it, not, uh, not loving it. And honestly, I kind of find people who aren't from the area, um, who have like this romance with Ink and Dagger, like a little suspect. Um, yep. but, um, but yeah, you know, tremendously important to me. And, uh, it's funny, uh, you know, Jeff from Thursday sang for, uh, sang for the reunion shows and I didn't know him at the time. And, uh, you know, I thought, I thought he did a tremendous job, but like, you know, He's like, he's one of my best friends now. And so this is a constant conversation. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, um, whatever. Fuck it. I, I love Ink and Dagger. Don DeVore is the best, the best guitar player in the world. Um, uh, very complicated band, very complicated people. Yes. I, I ask because I was obsessed with them, like probably to unhealthy levels and they remain one of my favorites today. So, you know, you coming from the same area, it's a, it's a vibe check. Oh dude, big time, big time. That is a band that could only exist in that area at that time. It's like you turned the fucking vampires into this allegory about fucking being a scumbag in Philadelphia. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, t- 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 I mean, on, on every possible level, talk about a band that just like wouldn't fly today. Uh, but God bless them. Absolutely. So when did you decide you wanted to start playing music? I always wanted to, and, you know, I started playing guitar when I was like, you know, 12 or 13, but I would like, I didn't have like the patience, uh, or like, you know, the dexterity for it. And so I gave it up like pretty Im- immediately. And, uh, but I started singing in, in like high school bands, like, you know, w- whatever, like two singer fucking emo bands, uh, of, uh, and you know, what kind of emo I'm talking about. Um, and, uh, like, you know, started doing that in the, uh, you know, the mid nineties. And, uh, you know, it was, it was never anything serious. Like, you know, like my high school band, I think played Stalag once to like, you know, to like 20 people. And, uh, and, and for real, it, it felt like Madison square garden. Like at this point I've played some pretty big shows in front of some pretty big crowds, but like that one time at Stalag in my mind is still like the biggest show I've ever played. And, um, so there was like, you know, there was a lot of, of that just kind of bouncing around that world, but with like, you know, other like upper Darby and like Aston dickheads. And, um, yeah, you know, that was, that was cool, but I just, I didn't have my shit together. And, uh, you know, how so eh, I was like kind of like an emotional wreck. Uh, I was an emotional wreck when I had like stopped partying. And then when I picked up again, I just like wasn't functional, you know? Um, when did you pick up again? 
Um, I think I was 18. Um, I actually, yeah, no, I was 18. I, 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 I had the story just fucking crystallized in my head. Fucking, I decided that I was going to smoke weed. And one day I was at my friend's house and I smoked weed and it was fine. Nothing happened. Week later, dystopia was playing at Stalag. A bunch of my friends were at the new angle across the street. I decided that I was going to drink with them and I drank. Nothing bad happened within, within a month's time. I was like buying liquid ketamine and cooking it in a microwave oh, and shit. like fucking nice. like, you know, like, uh, whatever fucking like, you know, like dirty Coke, dirty speed I could get my hands on. Um, and it, like, yeah, it was like fucking like, you know, it was like zero to fucking, you know, a billion in a month. And uh, it just like, you know, it just kind of stayed like that. Like, you know, like, yeah, within a month I was like, you know, like straight up, like, like I was way harder than I ever was before I stopped. Um, yeah. Already at 18 years old. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was really cool. How long did that continue? Because my, myself, I don't know. I had close to two decades of drugs and quitting and starting up again and escalating and de-escalating before I finally quit for the long period of time that I've quit now. And that's a whole other podcast in and of itself. But what about you, Michael? Oh, man. Um, Well, like, drugs and booze, it really worked for me for a long time. Um, When I, you know, I view my first drink, uh, like, you know, the first time that I got drunk as like a romantic experience. And uh, like, you know, when I picked up that, you know, that second time at the new angle, like that was like, you know, I met the love of my life, you know? And, um, you know, I remember like, I, like I started, you know, pretty much like drinking on my own, like just like, you know, getting like, you know, a bottle of fucking like, you know, cheap vodka or like a couple of forties and sitting in my room at my mom's house and thinking like, man, like I deserve to feel this way. Like I, like, 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 I understand that this, like, this shit has taken out, like, tons of people around me. It's taken out, like, members of my family. It's, like, it's, it's fucked up my life. But, like, I'm going to get this right. Like, there's nothing, there's no way that something, like, so perfect could actually be terrible. Uh, or that made me feel so perfect could be terrible. And, like, I do believe that, like, you know, like, I... Uh, for a long time, it worked as like my medicine. It calmed me down. It made me like able to kind of like, you know, integrate within like within social situations in ways that I wasn't able to before. Um, right. And cause I, I felt like just like combustible when I like, you know, when I wasn't um, when I wasn't drinking or using. Yeah. I literally did not, socialize without alcohol or drugs or both like that that is something i never learned i just i just always did it yeah yeah i mean i i never learned it either like you know my i started very early and then i had this like you know like like two three year gap where like i didn't do anything but like you know i spent that time like going through puberty and like wanting to explode and like, you know, it it was horrible. And, um, and then I drank again and it was better for a while. And, but I'm, you know, I, I pretty quickly like got like, you know, got physically hooked again. Um, or, or not, I shouldn't even say physically hooked again. I pretty quickly got physically hooked because I don't know if I really was hooked before. And, uh, you know, the next thing I knew I was fucking 29 and I would periodically try to like, you know, try to stop drinking. And in order for me to try to stop drinking, I would wind up like having to like lock myself in a room with weed and benzos in order to knock myself out. Um, and like, that was my idea of sobriety. Like I <laughs> like, 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 cause like, I mean, it had been, you know, years, uh, since I had like slept sober and like, you know, they, like the times that I would string together 
two, three days, always in the beginning of January. Like the beginning of January, I made this big deal with my friends. Like, you know, we would call it like the month of power. I I, I made this big deal, month of power. I'm going to fucking, you know, like no drugs, no alcohol. I'm going to do all this fucking exercise and I'm going to fucking meditate, blah, blah, blah. Never lasted longer than three days. And, um, you know, I guess people call that dry January now. Um, yep. And, uh, you know, like more power to them. Like I just... My friends lasted. I, I, I couldn't. And, um, you know, I'd spend those, those days like awake and like shaking and terrified. And then I would wind up like, you know, going down the street to daddy's and fucking, you know, getting, a like, you know, getting a, a Jameson and talking to my bartender and, uh, you know, staying there. And, uh, that was that, uh, you know, it wasn't, and I, I would, I tried that a, a number of times and, you know, shit just got to a point for me where like I had resigned myself to like, I was going to die that way. And, um, I didn't care like at all. Um, then I had a, a very good friend pass away and, um, you know, it, 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 it really fucked me up and like, Shortly after that, I decided that I was going to like, you know, quit using drugs. And, uh, you know, at that point I was really like only kind of like, you know, doing Coke and like, you know, like occasionally snorting dope, like, um, <laughs> but like, you know, like not like, like, you know, there were times in my life where I was like, you know, fucking like, you know, full on fucking like, you know, like crackhead type shit. And like, yep. I, I was not, yep. I was not at that, at that moment. Um, but I was like, you know doing a lot of fucking like shitty 20 bags and fucking, you know, like, yeah, like fucking like, you know, doing like the occasional bag of dope. And like, it was like fine. Like what I thought was manageable. And then I went to quit and I didn't have any real physical withdrawal. Um, but like I didn't quit drinking of course, cause I fucking couldn't. And the blackout started. And the blackouts were fucking gnarly. Like I would have like how much time would you black out? Are we talking a night or like a day or two you don't remember? Oh, I mean like the day or two that I don't remember would be more like um yeah you know, would be more kind of like, oh, I just don't remember it in my like it's not stored in my memory right now. Um <laughs> but uh, at, like you know, at like just like, ooh, that was I forgot that wild weekend. But as far as like actual blackouts go, it would be a few hours, you know, um, yeah. typically, but like, you know, weird shit would fucking happen. Like, you know, one time I went into a blackout and I came to, and I was on the Chinatown bus and uh, like, I had to like go through my phone to figure out which city I was going to, um, <laughs> and like why. And it was, it was Valentine's day. And I was like going to Philly to like hang out with this woman who I like, you know, occasionally hung out with. Um, and, uh, I was like, well, I, I hope I wasn't like too annoying when I talked to her. And, um, then, you know, another time, like, you know, my, my last, like super crazy drunk, uh, actually, no, it wasn't my last super crazy drunk, but my last like really big drunk incident was, um, I played a show in Providence and, uh, you know, the night before I had been again, trying to kind of quit drinking or trying to like taper off. And a friend of mine came over with a handle of whiskey the night before, and we were just going to watch movies. And I like, I almost started crying when I saw the handle because like, it was like the way that I drink is like, if something is in my proximity and I have access to it, I need, it needs to be gone. Like it, it like, like, like it can't, like, there's no such thing as fucking like, leftover or anything i don't understand these <laughs> fucking people who like don't do everything in there like like i i've never had like left like leftover fucking coke or fucking dope or pills or fucking or or, or, right. beer, or beer like are you fucking kidding me or wine like fuck you <laughs> uh, like like, like this, this, um but anyway i i digress um i got really upset and like lo and behold like I drank pretty much this entire handle. And uh, the next day I get into a van, go and play a show uh, in Providence. And I have to like, you know, 
get drunk again in order to kind of keep myself fucking balanced. And like, you know, the whole day was just, my life was like, just like this balancing act of like fucking, you know, trying to like alleviate, uh, come downs and withdrawal at that point. But, um, that night after the show, we were staying with, uh, uh, Ben from, uh, from load records. And, uh, uh, we were sleeping on, uh, on his floor and, uh, you know, we went to bed and I woke up, at, or we, we went, went to sleep on the floor and I woke up, I was in a bed and I was crying and I was like so upset over like, you know, dead friends and fucking, you know, it's just miserable, blah, blah, blah. I wanted to kill myself, yada, yada. And after a while, I, you know, my phone starts ringing and it's, it's like our, it's my bandmates and they're like, where the fuck are you? And I was like, I'm in bed. Where, where the fuck are you? They're like, what bed? So in a blackout, I had like broken into an apartment and, <laughs> uh, and slept in a bed. And fortunately enough, nobody was there. You pulled the, uh, Robert Downey Jr. I pulled a Robert Downey Jr. Wow. Like for, like for fucking real. Um, and that's like, that's like not even like that weird. That's not even like the first, like that shit happened. Like when I lived in fucking West Philly, that shit happened with my fucking roommates all the time. And like, you know, um, and, and it was like, it sucked. I, 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 it was no way to, um, it was no way to live. And, uh, you know, I moved to New York because I just like, like, I was like, oh, cool. Like I'm going to move to New York and I'm going to get clean. I'm going to like, I'm going to stay with my dad. My dad was like in recovery at the time and, uh, you know, shit's going to be okay. I'm going to figure it out. Lo and behold, I moved to New York. It turns out that my dad had fucking relapsed and, uh, oh, no. and, um, you know, uh, and like, dude, my dad was a dentist when he fucking relapsed, he relapsed by doing fucking 80 gallon tanks of nitrous oxide in single shots the gnarliest shit i've ever seen it was fucking he's still brutal. alive nah nah he did he he's he passed away uh but uh I, not not due to drugs though he died from cancer um oh. so that's uh and he, and he died he died clean too so uh you know i'm fucking uh i'm 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 proud of him for that but uh that is good yeah that he died cl- well wait it's not good okay uh, there's no good way to say this, so continue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, that's the fucking goal, though. Like, if you like, dude, yeah. if you're a fucking junkie or like a, an addict or a drunk, and like you get to fucking die, like with dignity, like yes. I mean, there, that, that's that's remarkable. Like, that's all I want right now is like, and like I don't, I don't necessarily think that that's going to happen because like I, can, I to this day can't imagine not drinking or doing drugs for the rest of my life that's way too big so but like if i happen to die clean and sober like i'll you know i'll be fucking stoked for that um but then again like you know like that that's further down the pipe and fortunately enough i don't have to fucking think about that right now um but yeah like within a month like i had found fucking people who like to party like me and uh you know uh i turned new york into philadelphia and um yeah you know um and series of friendships and bands and fucking you know like emotional collapses and shitty jobs like you know eventually i bottomed out and um you know it gotten to the point where like i couldn't imagine living with it or without it. Um, and it was like, all right, cool. Like, you know, well, am I going to kill myself? Cause life is fucking meaningless. Um, and like, I just like, I didn't have the balls to kill myself. And there was like, you know, this all ties into like, you know, my first kind of quote unquote real band and like our breakup. Cause this all happened coinciding with that. Like our drummer, like it came out that our drummer was like a fucking serial rapist and like, all this shit what? and it was like oh dude it was like fucking like you know and, and it was all over like fucking like you know it was all over like met like punk message boards were a big thing at the time and it was like it was like the thing on the punk message boards like if you remember boardcrucial.org like it was like yep like it was like the big thing there it fucking like you know it made its way to like fucking brooklyn vegan and pitchfork and it made its way to like fucking like like you know like 
like the Washington city paper. Uh, like it was fucking crazy. And along, you know, along that time, like I would like, you know, I was like fucking like shoving booze down my throat, shoving benzos down my throat, fucking doing whatever. And like, I felt nothing, nothing at all. And like, you know, my dad fucking, uh, like, and I called my dad and I was like, I think I'm having a nervous breakdown. And he's like, well, what'd you take today? And I like, you know, I recited, <laughs> like, I kind of like recited, like, you know, whatever. And he's like, let's get you into detox. And, um, you know, uh, I, I put a, went into detox and I put a couple days together. And when I got out, um, you know, I didn't really have any friends anymore. And I was so scared because I didn't know how I didn't know how to live without fucking drinking. And I thought that I was going to go right to a bar or right to a liquor store. And I didn't, you know, fortunately enough, like in detox, I was given access to some resources and I, um, you know, I took those and, uh, um, you know, things progressively got better and, um, you know, um, to, uh, to embrace the cliche, like, you know, I like, you know, life beyond my wildest dreams. Like, I mean, there's fucking, there are people, um, you know, who, uh, I love very much, um, who, um, you know, aren't around, uh, or like either cause they died or they're just like, you know, too far gone now. And, um, and I miss them a lot and, um, God, it's like, you know, fucking easy to, you know, be like, like, Oh, like, why not them? Like, what I mean, it's like, it doesn't fucking matter. Like, right. I, you know, I just, I miss my fucking friends. Um, and I'm grateful that like I landed where I landed, you know, I got a bunch of cash and prizes along the way. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. It's fucking, it's cool, but it's like, you know, I, none, I have none of it. If I, I'm not a functional addict and uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a functional alcoholic. If I don't, if I lose that, like I can't do any of this. Well, first, let me say very inspiring. You're, we have very similar stories, very similar stories. And it's great that you managed to leave it all behind. Are you still totally clean and sober? Yeah. How long now? Uh, just shy of 12 years. It'll be 12 years next month. That's incredible. Congrats. And I think I think this is a great story for people to hear because for so long, I refused to get any help or didn't know how to. And I just was wandering, hopeless, aimless. So I think hearing stories like these is important for people to have some kind of direction because I didn't have any. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't either for, for the longest time. And, you know, like, it's so fucking weird. Uh, uh, and like, I'm glad that we're having this conversation, um, the way that we're having it. It's, uh, but the, you know, this is, this goes into something that I, I tend to be kind of cautious about because I, you know, for years when I was out there, like I, I took like the way that I like drank and used as like, you know, like I kind of like used it as like, or I viewed it as like this like bludgeoning instrument against society. It was something that separated me from other people and, um, you know, it made me different. I'm fucking dark. I'm fucking real. I'm like, you know, you know, like, like you've got nothing on me. And, uh, you know, these days right now, like where we are like fucking, you know, February, like ninth or 10th, whatever the fuck day it is in 2022, like I'm just like a regular fucking guy with like, you know, a couple of jobs and like fucking like, you know, a family and, uh, and rent and bills to pay. And that's like, that's remarkable. And I like, I like living in that. And, you know, when I typically, when I do these podcasts or interviews, like I like, you know, fucking like, drugs and shit it's like a big part of my life uh and so like you know it comes up um i tend to try to like stay away from, uh, from talking about recovery because it's like such a polarizing thing um but like i'm gonna do it right here uh if that's okay um yes and uh you know 
I like not to fucking break traditions, but I'm just going to break traditions here. It's like, you know, <laughs> I, I like, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous consistently for a long time. It's, it works for me. Um, I don't want to, you know, get into details about how or why, uh, that's a whole other thing, but this is what works for me. However, it is far from the only fucking game in town, you know? Yes. I know people who have had wonderful experiences with smart recovery. I know wonder, I know people who have had wonderful experiences with just fucking exercising a bunch and talking to some people and yep. like just knowing that like, Hey, like, you know, there are sober people out there whose life kind of went on and like, there's this like kind of like illusion, like, you know, you'll hear in the room sometimes like, you know, like, you know, like if you're like not working a program or that way, then like, you're not really sober. And like, that's a fucking load of shit. Like if you're not fucking like it, if you're not like, picking up a, like one day at a time you're sober like they're, they're like it's that fucking simple you know yeah. and like i like you know i like wh- when they talk about fucking you know like quitting the debate society i quit the debate society 100 percent, and that means that i don't really give a fuck what other people do period yeah uh, you just gotta find you gotta find your thing yeah man Wh- whatever it is yeah and these days for me it's fucking loose garment sobriety you know i like i still go to meetings i still talk to people i'm not as involved as i used to be but like fortunately enough i, I developed some tools to be able to fucking deal with my emotions in a way that makes sense to me uh, there are other people in my life who developed different tool sets or similar tool sets, different ways. And like, so it's like, look, man, if somebody's listening to this and like, you know, like you don't want to fuck, like, like you want to get clean. You can't imagine getting clean, but like, you know, you don't want to go to AA and like, you know, you think that like, fuck, like I'm going to have to go to AA. It's like, you don't fucking have to go to AA. If you want to go to AA, try it. It works for me. If you don't want to fucking go to AA, don't go to AA. Like, find something that works like try the key is to try different things you tried all the drugs try the different flavors of recovery whatever it is find the one that works for you there is a fucking lot you know and uh you know like it did like straight up like god okay so i remember like i got out of fucking detox and i ran i went to this meeting and i ran into this dude that i used to roll with in philly who i hadn't seen in years and this guy was like the gnarliest piece of shit junkie. And he had fucking, you know, he had like five years clean time at that point. And I was like, man, if this motherfucker can stay clean, (laughs) I can do this. And like, let me tell you guys, like I was fucking like, you know, I was gray. I weighed like 125 pounds. And like, dude, I'm like, you know, I'm like 5'11", almost six feet tall. I'm not supposed to weigh 125 fucking pounds. So... (laughs) I had like, I was fucking shaking. It took me six months to be able to fucking read again, read. Like it was fucking bad. I got clean. If I could get clean, anyone can do it. Like you can, it's possible. And like, there doesn't have to be any greater goal than just like, Hey man, like I'm going to try not to do this today. It all starts with one day. Yeah, yeah. Fucking worry about tomorrow whenever tomorrow comes. If tomorrow comes, who gives a shit? Like, that's it. I, I'm not going to fucking throw like this like, eh, one day at a time platitudes. Like, but like, it's true. Like, it works if you work it, Mike. So fucking work it. <laughs> so live it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so did uniform come about in your newly wonderful sober life? Oh, God. Fucking uniform. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> well, I want to I want to squeeze in a little promotion for you. You got this tour coming up. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, it's odd because like uniform kind of came around uh, because of a ninth step. Uh, this, this guy Ben Greenberg, who plays guitar in uniform, um, was a producer for uh, the band that I used to play in called Drunk Driver, 
And uh, what was the amends? What'd you do to him? Are you willing uh, to share that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I basically just fucking like you know when I quit that band, I did it like you know pretty publicly, and I did it without kind of consulting anybody, and uh, it was just like you know like there was a lot going on, and I don't regret like doing that. I do regret the impact that it had on some people. And yes. like, you know, I kind of view it as like an inevitability now, but like that doesn't take away from the fact that it hurt a bunch of people and that like I should have at least talked to a lot of these people before fucking pulling the trigger. Um, but like I don't feel bad about fucking just being like, you know, like ba- about quitting and being like, yeah, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't want to be in this band with this fucking weird rapist guy. So um, anyway, we had like moved in the same neighborhood. We we're both living on Graham Avenue and we'd run into each other and we just kind of got to talking and uh you know one day we had dinner and i did my fucking you know like bah, 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 you know I've, I've negatively impacted you like the fucking usual um <laughs> and um fucking um you know like that was kind of like we had a nice dinner and that was kind of like the seeds for everything else that happened and we decided that like Ben and I wanted to start a band, like a noise rock band, just the two of us. And we were going to do it with a drum machine because we didn't want to fucking deal with any other people. Um, Cause everybody else, yeah, I guess drummers, especially, huh? <laughs> Dude, I've got fucking like, you know, it's funny. Fucking like I've, I've got a thing with fucking, dr- I've had very good luck with drummers with this band. They've like where we worked with some of like the best, most wonderful fucking people. Um, but like, you know, uh, in old bands and old friendships of mine, like it's always the fucking drummer, man. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, we're like, we're just going to do it. The two of us with the drum machine. And, uh, you know, we started real fucking small. Um, and, uh, you know, we just started playing shows and didn't really make any fucking plans. Didn't really expect anything out of it. And, um, uh, and it developed, you know, how long were you grinding before things started picking up a bit? And what kind of venues were you playing in New York? Now I ask out of curiosity, I went to a lot of shows when I moved here, 2012 through 2016, but I don't remember any of them because I was drunk and high at all of them. You know, we played St. Vitus a few times, uh, like, you know, kind of like, you know, we'd be like, you know, the opening band at like, you know, like whatever, like, you know, Mike Williams side project, uh, of the night. Um, you know, or one time we, uh, we played, uh, we played St. Vitus, uh, with like white lung and, uh, you know, we opened that night and we blew a fuse on stage. Um, and, uh, you know, it was embarrassing. We, our first show was at home, sweet home at nothing changes. We brought our own PA and it was just like really shittily wired. And we also like Daisy chained it through the bars PA and it was like, you know, fucking speakers attached to power amps. Uh, within five minutes, the PA was like literally on fire, like on fire. <laughs> and, you know, like we had to stop because it was on, because there was a room filled with smoke and there was a fire. Um, and that was our first show. And there was just like, all and like, it's like, you know, like I say that now, it's like, oh man, that sounds fucking cool. It wasn't fucking cool. It was fucking embarrassing. <laughs> like, um, you know, like we got through five minutes worth of music. Like it sucked. And there was like, you know, it was like shit like that for a long time. But Ben, you know, Ben played in this band called the men and, uh, you know, who like are still around, um, and who, you know, who, who did quite well. And, you know, he really got a taste for fucking touring and pushing shit and so he would fucking push us to tour push us to play shows push us to like pick up like whatever we can and uh you know like after a while like we started to just like get better shows and we like we made a couple of records that like you know some people didn't hate and um you know like um it was a a very slow progression and it it still is a slow progression and uh you know like it's one of those things like i'm very very pleased and very grateful to be where we are i think that there are a lot of bands 
who uh, and a lot of people who are like a lot more talented than us and you know quote unquote better than us who like don't have nearly like the resources uh or the reach that we do and uh you know uh that's not to be like oh our fucking band sucks i think i I, I love our band it's it's a ton of fucking fun and i'm grateful that like you know some people seem to get stuff out of it but like you know i never want to lose sight of the fact that this is like a privilege nobody owes me or us shit like this is like you know um man, you know, uh, it, it blows my mind that like I get to fucking play music in front of people. Yeah. Isn't it the the greatest feeling? Because when I was deep in the throes of addiction, all I did was sit inside and watch Netflix and take drugs mm-hmm. and dream of, and, you know, think like, oh, my life is over. I never got to do what I wanted to do. And then when you get pull yourself out of that, I mean, you're living the dream. You're, you're doing the band. You've done some great tours. You're going to be doing some great tours. And I did the same thing. Like I released a record and I fronted the band for the first time. I was in a play and I got the lead in that. And this podcast came about kind of as a surprise. And this is my main focus right now with Tommy. And we love this thing. It's the, uh, the gifts of recovery. If I can hawk recovery a little more. Absolutely, man. It's like, it's all the shit that you talk about doing on a fucking bar stool and like <laughs> yeah. and like you know fucking like you know like sitting around with like you know like your one fucking friend and like you know like you're crying about your fucking parents uh and like talking about how like you're gonna start this fucking day you're gonna do and like when it happens how at least for me like how it happened it was like so fucking organic like everything just like it showed up in time and like I just like was around to like say yes to it when things came up. And exactly. Everything kind of lines up as long as you're staying in the process and saying yes to things and taking little risks. Like anything that I said specifically was going to happen didn't happen. Like after I got clean, I was like, okay, I'm gonna start this band and we're gonna be popular and I'm gonna tour and then I'm gonna have a career in music like I always said I wanted to have. And guess what? That didn't happen. But that's okay because all these other great things happen. Oh yeah, man! I dude, when I like, I I got a PS3. I bought a PS3 when I like uh, when when I got clean because I was like, I'm gonna just. I have no friends. I'm just gonna play a bunch of video games. I'm gonna get really good at video games. I never got. <laughs> I never got through a single video game. I've, I've I've been I've been too busy. Like I was busy in recovery um because like you know my first year like i didn't have shit to do but i got fucking busy in recovery and like you know life kind of took different places i worked this hilarious shitty job for the longest fucking time i sold tattoo supplies at the sketchy place on canal street that's like a new york legend fucking like gross spot called unimax and if anybody fucking tattooer who's listening to this you probably know the spot and I probably sold you fucking needles and uh, yeah. Um, But anyway, like I would fucking, you know, for years I would like go there. I'd fucking smoke weird drugs in the bathroom. I would fucking, (laughs) I I would take off my clothes and like lay on the bathroom floor and shake, you know, and like all this shit. And I never thought that I would fucking leave that. Like I stayed there because, well, they paid me and the boss was a fucking jerk off, but like, he gave me money and, uh, you know, he treated me like ass, but he never fired me. And I thought I was going to like, just like, you know, fucking die doing that. And like, lo and behold, a few years ago, I quit to do this band full time. And since then, like other like weird jobs, like popped up, like, you know, I, I do a lot of like, you know, freelance writing, freelance editing. I, um, you know, I don't know when this is going to air, but like, you know, uh, like I'm, uh, I'm going to start like working for this, like for this management company that I, uh, that, that I like a lot and that I've been tight with for a while. I, I work for St. Vitus. Like, you know, I do a lot of shit and it's, and, and, and I play in a fucking stupid band and like, <laughs> and like, I thought that I was just going to be fucking like, you know, selling like black ink to fucking uh, like annoying ass fucking like 
art school students uh, with, with, <laughs> with, 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 like, with like too much money and fucking, uh, God, I fucking hate art school students. Anyway, whatever. Um, <laughs> but I thought I was going to be selling fucking black ink to jerk offs until I fucking eventually keeled over. And that's not the case. Um, if you're listening and you're one of those like stick and poke people who buy fucking black ink at Unimax, I'm not talking about you specifically unless I am. So yeah, whatever. Yeah, just your friends. Just yeah, your just, friends. just just your friends. I, actually, just just don't fucking don't stop with the fucking stick and pokes. Everybody, just stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. So I really like the band, Mike. I really like what you guys are doing. The the combination of sounds, you know, and you, the noise rock and all that stuff. So l- let me get some plugs in here for you. Number one, well, we want to listen to the whole discography, number one. If you're not familiar with the band, get on it, folks. Uniform. Number two, I'm really enjoying Shame, your 2020 LP, which was released on Sacred Bones, right? Mm-hmm. Right? Yep, yep, that's the most recent one. And, folks, we've got a big tour coming up. Uniform is touring with Converge, Thou, and Full of Hell. There will be different bands on different dates of the tour, but the whole thing kicks off March 10th in Philadelphia at Underground Arts. Yep, yes? Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, Underground Arts on the 10th. It, it, uh, the bands are going to be the same on the tour, but we're going to be rotating spots in the lineup through, uh, uh. throughout the tour. So like, if you want to fucking see any one particular band other than Converge, Converge will be playing last every night. You got to come for the whole show because we're not telling when anybody's playing. I like that. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, yeah, you just want to fucking see Full of Hell or you just want to see Thou or you just want to see, no, nobody just wants to see us, but like you want to see fucking like one of these <laughs> other bands. Like, sorry, dog, you don't know when it's going to be. Show up on time. Have you ever played with Converge before? No, uh, we've toured with Wear Your Wounds. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had a lot of mutual friends and, uh, you know, I, I like I hit it off with those guys really hard. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was like, like, you know, fucking, I would like hang out with like Jake at the merch table every night. And that was a blast. And then like, you know, me and Sean, uh, would fucking, you know, talk shit about like tattooing and fucking techno music. And, uh, like it just fucking ruled, man. Um, and so, um, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a huge honor. Yeah. I mean, I've been listening to Converge since, geez, since I got into hardcore in 98. I've uh, They're probably the hardcore band I've seen at the most. Mm-hmm. One of them, at least. Yeah, man. Uh, like, they're, 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 they're one of mine, too. I got, oh God, I hope Jake doesn't fucking listen to this. I'm about to fucking tell a stupid story. Um, fuck, Jake, if you're listening to this, just turn it off. Um, and- yeah, also, Jake, uh, if you're listening to this, come on anytime. Uh, continue, Mike. Yeah, yeah, or if anybody's going to fucking see Jake or talk to Jake, just don't fucking tell him this. Um, <laughs> I'm going to plead ignorance. So anyway, like my first tattoo, right? My first tattoo was uh, the falling angel from the inside of Petitioning the Empty Skies. And I, I got it like uh, two days after my 18th birthday. and. Uh, you know, I was like, I was like so proud and, uh, you know, years and years went by and I wound up like, I got into like, you know, my mid twenties, I was like, man, I only fucking listen to techno and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I like started to get it covered up just cause I was getting this leg sleeve done. Like, not like, Oh, like, you know, I want to cover this up, but I was just getting this fucking leg sleeve done and I never finished it. And so now there's like this, like, you know, giant, like kind of like converge line work cover up on my leg. That's like, if you, if you see it, you still fucking like you see it. So anytime I'm around these fucking guys, I am wearing like, I, I, I'm committed to wearing fucking long pants forever. <laughs> like, you know, and uh, like I, I've made it a point not to fucking tell uh jake about this and then i just did um and i you know i i hope he doesn't listen and like if he does listen i hope he doesn't bring it up to me because it's going to be awkward i would guess this happens to jake a lot i'm sure he runs into ton of people on tour and on otherwise who have converged tattoos they got when they were 18 oh yeah 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 definitely the the difference being those people probably never started to get them covered up 
uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I only did because I was in this point where I was just like, I'm getting this leg sleeve of things and like, you know, like whatever. And like, you know, like, man, I don't even listen to hardcore anymore. So like, yeah, you can fucking like do, and, and it's just like, it, it, it's just weird. Um, but, uh, that's funny. So you had a phase where you only listened to elect electronic music. You said you were done with hardcore. Yeah. For, uh, well, you know, it, like I listened to primarily electronic music at that point. I still, I still do like, you know, like listen to, you know, a lot of electronic music. Um, yeah, I can hear the industrial and different influence in uniform for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's- it's not your stand. Uniform's not your standard hardcore metallic band. There's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting dynamics going on. Yeah. And if you like that, not to fucking plug my own shit, blah, but like, you know, I do a lot of solo electronic stuff and like most of that kind of falls into the techno realm. Yeah. You know, I'd say like, you know, during my mid twenties, it was a lot of like, you know, like fucking like, you know, acid house shit, you know? And, uh, then, um, at the same time, I like, I never got like fully away from guitar music. Like I was still like, you know, fucking like obsessive about like, you know, the Jesus lizard and the brain bombs and like, you know, whatever. Like I was like, like kill slug. Like I was like the full on like fucking like gross noise rock dude. And like, I still, I mean, I, that's like my favorite music is just like fucking like totally like not vapid, but just like, just like irresponsibly brutal, dirty, disgusting noise rock. Uh, like, like just like music made by fucking criminals who like <laughs> are singing about like the most awful shit in the world playing like, you know, one chord and like not hitting it in time. And like, just like, like, you know, like rusted shuts, like the best band in the world, you know? And it's like those guys, like, you know, Domikos is, uh, you know, their drummer. If, uh, if he's listening, shout out Domikos, but, uh, fucking, you know, he's a human being fucking Don Walsh. They're fucking guitar player, like singer guy. Like that guy is like, he's, he's not really a functional human, man. Like <laughs> best band, man. Fucking. I look at the fucking Larry lifeless bands, fucking, you know, kill slug and fucking like upside down cross. And then there's this like other one like that. I'm not going to say, cause the name's kind of sketchy, but like, uh, the band's not sketchy. The name's sketchy. Um, but like, you know, like this guy, like wasn't a functional fucking human being. He's just like this fucking like, you know, gross crackhead. And like, that's like I like music made by people who like fucking suffer. And how about a uh, buzz oven? Oh fuck yeah, man! Uh, <laughs> dude, I heard this craziest buzz oven story. Uh, There's a million. Yeah, please tell us. You, have you heard the one where they're fucking uh, where their roadie died outside of CBS? Yeah. You, you, you know this one. And the the a band member was kicking him because he apparently stole the dope of the guy kicking him, and yep. he like died. Yep. Yeah, he stole. He's, he's, <laughs> yeah, he OD'd and died after he stole all the dope, and the guy was just fucking kicking him for doing all the dope. <laughs> <laughs> these are the stories I love. Oh, dude, they're the best. Uh, they're, uh, these are my people. I mean, yeah, like like that's the thing is like I understand on a primal level playing in a band because you can't fucking deal with society and like this is your way to kind of like get around and like it is your fucking lifestyle and um you know like this is like that's that there is no greater goal than like getting fucked up and doing damage and (laughs) i respect that um however and and i was in a band like that for, for 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 quite a while uh, that is not the kind of band that I'm in now. And I'm very, uh, and that's not the kind of person I am these days. Um, I am very grateful for that because like, I feel it in the back of my head, like just like talking like this, like how I'm still so attracted to those bands and that kind of people. Like, yeah. like in the back of my head, I know that if I'm not fucking like vigilant and like, I'm not on my shit, I could fucking go back to fucking just being like that. And oh, yeah. Like, I don't want to be fucking, like, you know, dead outside of fucking St. Vitus with, like, you know, fucking my band member kicking me. Like, that sucks. <laughs> like, 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 
I don't know. Like, but like, it's got to happen to somebody. So yeah, man, fuck it. Is it hard on tour? Because you're, I mean, me, my, my recovery and my everything depends on rigorous scheduling and uh, routine and ritual and all of this stuff. I imagine on tour, you're pulled out of your your normal, comfortable circumstances. What do you do to stay centered on tour? You know, like it was harder at first, but like over the years, I've gotten very comfortable in my surroundings. And, you know, what I do is like, if there's, if I'm in an environment that makes me uncomfortable, like if there's drugs around, for instance, like I leave, you know, um, I can't be around drugs, period. And, uh, you know, I won't like physically hold somebody's drink because like if somebody asked me to like hold their beer or hold like, you know what, I can't do that. Like it, like I have like a, a physical reaction to it. Like it just, it just makes me feel weird. But you know, like, I mean, I, I work at a bar now and, um, it's, it doesn't particularly bother me. Like it's one of those things where like, if I have a reason to be somewhere, I can be there. I just, I don't overstay. Um, I don't like, you know, go early and hang out late. You know, I'm there, I'm there to do a job and to perform service. And when that service is, is finished, then I walk away, you know, and if I view it as a job, then I have a pretty good separation. Um, but other than that, it's like, you know, while I'm on tour, I try to like, just stay in touch with people who are, you know, also in recovery. I try to get a lot of quiet time and, um, I like, you know, I, I try to stay connected as much as I can. Yeah. Same here. You're speaking my language. I'm, I'm so tied in. It would, it would be hard to get out at this point. Hell yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like, you know, I, like, I think about like, you know, if I was to go out, like, you know, I, I used to be one of those dudes with like fucking like, you know, all these sponsees and service commitments and whatever God, yeah. but like, which is like, you know, it's not the case for me right now, but like, but still like, I mean, I think such a, a big part of like having sponsees and having service commitments and being ingrained is that like, if you go out, like you have to fucking undo all this shit. It's like, Oh, you got to fucking call this person, let them know that they need to go on with the rest of their lives differently. You need to fucking like, you know, the, the meeting needs to get somebody new to, to fucking get, do coffee and then you're gonna have all these fucking people calling you because they're like you know they're your it's not just like oh like the people in recovery that you know they, they're your fucking friends and like man before i got into recovery shit i figured that like everybody in the rooms would just be like you know fucking like you know sad dorks and uh lo and behold that's like not the case like it's like everybody who I ever like wanted to fucking it's a it's a bunch of people who partied the way that I fucking partied and like you know as far as creative people it's like the people who stuck around and stayed doing shit and like you know like whatever like they're largely around because like you get to a point where it's like you're gonna fucking if you don't get clean you just fucking die so like it, it doesn't suck uh, and so like <laughs> everybody is just people there's cool people there's annoying people there's assholes there's there's people you really vibe with. it's just people oh yeah big time big time there are so many people that i love and you know that i cherish deeply there's also just like you said there's fucking assholes it takes all <laughs> it takes all kinds man like everybody just trying to get through the fucking day though yeah well wow you're you're really speaking my language, I got to say. Likewise, bud. Likewise, this is a this is a pleasure. Okay, so let's recap, folks. Here's what we've got coming up. Number one, we want to check out the uniform discography, right? Yes. Might as well listen to the whole thing. I mean, if you haven't heard the band, you've got to. You've got to. Yeah. That's number one. Start with the most recent. Start with the most recent. Work your way back. It gets progressively worse if you're working your way back. <laughs> That's the way I do it. Number two, we've got this tour coming up with Converge, Thou, Full of Hell, and of course, Uniform. It kicks off March 10th in Philadelphia at Underground Arts. Excellent venue. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've played there before. It's fantastic. And number three, if you're struggling with drugs and alcohol, just know there's answers out there, but you got to do work to find them. You got to figure out 
what works for you. For some people, it's the uh, anonymous fellowships. For some people, it's smart recovery. Some people just become huge workout people and get into that or martial arts, and that's cool. Some people just throw themselves into music and they're okay, and that's cool. You just got to find you got to find your flavor. Yep, yep. Whatever the fuck works for you, it doesn't matter. Like it, like all that matters is like just don't try not to get too far ahead of yourself. Don't think that you can't fucking drink or do drugs for the rest of your life. And just it's like okay, like I'm not gonna fucking drink or I'm not gonna do drugs tonight. You know, that's fucking it. I don't fucking care how you do it. Honestly, like, I, I don't know. Like, your recovery is your recovery. My recovery is my recovery. I wish everybody well. I pass no judgment one way or the other, period. Yes, absolutely. And you said you do some uh, solo electronic music. Can, can we hear it? Is there somewhere we can check oh, it out? Oh, yeah, there's a bunch. Uh, if you go on Bandcamp, I have a... Uh, Let's see, if you just search my fucking name on Bandcamp, Michael Burdan, you're going to see, uh, you know, a bunch of releases from Deathbed Tapes, uh, from uh, Found Remains. Uh, there's a release coming out from this uh, Italian label called Angst, uh, a release from Outsider Arts. And this is all, like, techno to noise stuff. And uh, another one with this great label called uh, Industrial Coast. Um, they're, 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 I, I, I could spend a fucking hour like reciting these and I've got a pretty big one coming up on, uh, this label called, uh, called lies. And, um, uh, you know, that, uh, a very, very dear friend of mine, my old roommate, uh, runs, uh, out of Paris and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, very excited about that. It sounds nothing like uniform it is a bunch of like crazy harsh beats and um you know um if you like pounding your head against the wall to a bunch of weird rhythms then i got you excellent yeah how do you do any programming and that type of stuff for uniform yeah ben does like ben does the bulk of like the engineering um because you know, he's a fucking, like, he's a studio guy. He's a studio producer and engineer. Um, I do, you know, a lot of the synth stuff. Um, and uh, at, at this point, kind of like the bulk of the synth stuff um, and a lot of the drum programming. Um, you know, uh, Mike Sharp does all of the live drums uh, on the recordings. And, uh, you know, and then we have uh, this, like, really fucking, like, wonderful dude, Mike Bloom, uh, who we've been playing with live and, uh, he's, you know, th this kid's 23 years old and like, dude, uh, okay. Before I fucking cut, I got to tell the fucking story about this kid. So fucking this fucking kid, right? I am God, I'm going to do some fucking name dropping right here. All right. So I'm walking, I'm walking down the street in Greenpoint with fucking, uh, with Jeff from Thursday. Right. And like, we're just fucking sitting or like standing there talking and I get this tap on the shoulder and it's this fucking kid. And, uh, he's like, Oh, do you like, Hey, like, sorry to bother you. Do you play in uniform? I'm like, yeah. He's like, Oh my God, I fucking love you guys. I saw you with deaf Evan. I saw you at, uh, I saw you with the body. Oh my God. You guys are the fucking best, blah, blah, blah. Um, and like, you know, I mentioned Jeff because Jeff gets stopped all the time. Cause he fucking plays in a giant band and I'm just like some dildo who's in this thing. Um, <laughs> and, um, and anyway, uh, um, I was like, oh yeah, shit, thanks. I saw that the guy was wearing, the kid was wearing a laminate, right? And uh, I was like, oh, like you're, like, do you play in a band? Like you're, like, you know, looks like you got, you know, got something going on. He's like, oh yeah, I like, man, I play drums. Like, you know, I'm, I'm on tour with this fucking, I don't know, it's just, it's stupid. I'm on tour with this band called fucking uh, Belfagor and this other band called uh, Dark Funeral. And um, I was like, oh shit, uh, like okay cool he's like yeah i guess if you want to go um like you know like i don't know i'm just doing drum stuff like if you want to go like you can come i was like I, I very well might um anyway i didn't go to the show but i started talking to this kid on instagram like i saw that he followed me on instagram and like i followed him back and he posted a bunch of drum videos and his drumming was just fucking crazy so that dude like we just stayed in touch and now this kid who fucking stopped me on the street uh it was a 23 year old from asbury park uh like is like 
this ridiculous machine and like our live drummer and it's fucking insane um because like our our main drummer uh mike sharp he has like he has a kid he's got uh you know lots of family responsibilities and he lives in texas and so he can't go out so we're like you know this fucking guy's amazing uh that like you know this, this kid that we're working with mike bloom um he's the fucking best and uh our, our good friend uh jenna rose who does uh this project called anatomy up here she's been playing bass with us and like she's fucking ridiculous um you know we've got a really solid live band right now and i'm very i'm very happy that's awesome that's a great story too because it shows you know just it doesn't hurt to say hello you never know what'll happen yeah just fucking just, just say hi you know like don't don't just so just say hi don't fucking punish me but be be cool say hi yeah, st- just start by saying hi. Don't be like, hey, if you, you know, hi, I play drums. If you ever need a drummer, you can't do it like that. Don't do that. Don't, um, d- don't be like, hey, d- like, don't try to fucking sell yourself. Don't, uh, th- there's a lot of don'ts. Just use common sense. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but like say hi and be a human being. It like, it, it feels good. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, thank you. I think being natural is the key. The, I've I have found that things have to progress naturally. If you're trying to force something, or if you if you just want something from somebody, then it's it's probably not a good idea. Yeah, don't 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 try to fucking sell me something. Also, like, don't ask me to do like a crazy amount of emotional labor. Like, don't fucking like you know start telling me about your childhood right away. Uh, <laughs> but like you know we, we we we'll 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 get to that after we're talking for a bit. But like. You know, just, <laughs> just say hi. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. And uh, on that note, Mike, after I hit stop, I need to uh, pour out my soul to you and share my entire story of addiction from beginning to end. Or, are you cool with that? I'm entirely cool with that. Uh, th- that that sounds fucking great. Uh, you know, we uh, uh, I got a bunch of time before fucking South Park comes on. So, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mike, this was a real pleasure, and uh, we just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. You know, we really like what you're doing with Uniform, and uh, I hope I get to meet you someday. Likewise, likewise, definitely. We're fucking neighbors, man. Let's fucking make it happen. There you have it, folks. Mike Burdan. That was a wild ride. I loved that conversation. I didn't know any of that stuff, Tommy. And I have to say, I'm pl- I like to go into the episode not knowing everything. Now, don't be mistaken. We do a lot of research. We are ready to speak to the wonderful guests that we have on the show. But there's some. I like the conversation to be the first time we're talking to them, and we learned a lot. I didn't know he was from Philly. Yeah. I didn't know he was living in Brooklyn. We were talked afterwards, and I didn't know we know some of the same people. Very pleasant conversation. Went off the grid. Went in directions I didn't expect. I, it was great. It was great. He's a great. He's a great storyteller too. Like you can tell when he's ramping up to something really good. You're like, okay, hold on. <laughs> like, yes, yes, <laughs> this is going to be amazing. <laughs> like, I I also love when people are uh, extremely open and candid about uh you know mistakes they've made or decisions they've made in their past and uh you know and then they talk about it in a way from that that growth standpoint of like yeah this was at the time a decision i made and may or may not have been fucked up however this is what i've learned from it and this is what i do differently now yeah and you know i related so much to his story from being fucked up in philadelphia to moving to new york and getting even more fucked up and then stopping and then finding passion in the arts again and having that be your thing. I hear these stories all the time because I'm involved in recovery and to hear a similar story on the show, it's like a bonus. I really, really enjoyed talking to Mike. I hope I get to meet him soon enough. And Uniform is a great band too. I really like what they're doing. They have such an interesting sound. They really have a cool sound. It's not just straightforward hardcore. It's like industrial mixed with electronic music mixed with heavy kind of straightforward hardcore yeah yeah really interesting stuff that they're doing i dig it so folks go check them out on tour if you're in our home city of philadelphia the tour kicks off march 10th at underground arts great venue great band uniform converge headlining yes what more could you ask for 
yeah, I, I, I kind of want to attend that show just so I can kind of put him in that awkward position of like, Hey, can I see that leg tattoo? <laughs> <laughs> and just make, make sure like Jacob or Kurt is somewhere within earshot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've got a couple new reviews, folks. Make sure you keep the reviews coming in. We love it. We need it. We appreciate it. We've got two new ones. All right. So I'm going to read them now. Here is a review from JR in WP. Five stars. Great pod. Came for the glassing content. Hung out for the rest. Thank you, Jr. Yes, glassing, glassing. We have we have had Corey Brim from Glassing on the show twice. Make sure you check it out. And if you have not heard the band yet, do yourself a favor and listen today. In in the top three bands I love right now. Oh yeah, they're great. They're great. We've got one more review from Orion Guide. Well, I know who that is. That's Mike Shaw. All right, five stars. He says, loving the Northeast scene. Now, Mike, we'll forgive you for calling us the Northeast scene still. You know, I actually do that sometimes still. I accidentally call us the Northeast scene. Well, it was the name for a long time. Like, oh, yeah. you know, well over a year, that's what we went by. So, you know, it's imagine that you just changed your name in the middle of like, you know, a year and a half long process. So it's going to take time to adjust. It's, it's fine. Yeah, it's understandable. All right, Mike says, can't recommend this pod enough. Hosts Keith and Tommy navigate the conversations seamlessly and provide valuable insights and comic relief. The myriad of perspectives give us a glimpse into the special time and genre of music. Illuminating and fun to listen to. Wow, even his re- even his review is like scholarly. Yeah. He ha- he really has a way with words. He certainly does. He's such a he's such a nice person. Period. Like he's like the nicest dude in the world. Oh. The best. Thank you, Mike. You're the best. Okay, so we did some reviews. Let's see. How are we doing, Tommy? How are you and I doing? Us? No. Are we? Are we together? Are we broken up? Uh, do you still hate me? <laughs> are, are we call? Are you calling? Are you fighting? Is it over? All right. Now I'm just saying jawbreak a lyrics. All right, you go. <laughs> you go first. Uh, I I had a really excellent weekend. My in-law, my mother-in-law took the girls for a day uh, so Kelly and I could get some stuff uh, around the house done that normally ends up being like a mad race to get done. Like, you know, six loads of laundry, all the other crap that has to go into running a household. Um, The other thing that I got to do because we didn't have the girls around was I got to finally play with my interface and record a little bit. Oh, yes. Now, Tommy is doing home recording, and he sent me a little sneak preview of what he's doing, and it sounded great. I saw you had the different amps set up. I'm sure there's all different types of plugins and interfaces and sounds you can work with, and the riff you were playing actually sounded really cool. It's uh, it's overwhelming. That's the one thing <laughs> I've gotten to. The other thing I've gotten to is I need to practice with a metronome. <laughs> <laughs> like I playing with the click track was like really, really difficult for me. And there's so many times where, you know, I, I, the thing I recorded was like 25 seconds or something like that. There's like four or five points where I can hear it go off time. And I'm like, uh, all right, well, at least I got the idea down. The idea is there that, that I can fine tune it and kind of get used to playing with the click track. But yeah, that's something because I haven't been playing with other people and I've literally just been playing by myself. I've ignored a metronome my last 15 or 20 years of playing guitar. So uh, I will get better at that as I uh, go along. But one of the other exciting things is that I showed Evelyn how to use it and how we can plug her keyboard um, from the USB into GarageBand and she can use all the MIDI presets that are in there. And she was just fascinated. She was like, can I, how do I play with this? And I'm like, I showed her the basics of it. And I was like, do you just want me to leave you alone? She's like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just come back in like 20 minutes. I want to see what I can do. So I set the microphone up for, her, I set the keyboard up for, her, I came back and she had, uh, like a little thing recorded of her just kind of talking to get the, the volume ready and like kind of figure out where it was. Like she was very, <laughs> let's just say this. She was very organized about the way she went through kind of like picking what to record and i was like well how about with the midi like what sound did you pick and she's like daddy i'm not even through half of them she's like i want to listen to all of them i want to pick a really cool sound and i was like you know what all right so she had like a little notebook with her and she was writing down the sounds that she liked 
So when she goes to record, she'll have like a list of things she can kind of go with. So yeah, it was really, really fun. Uh, but yeah, really relaxing weekend. Tons of work got done. House is incredibly clean. And I got a little bit of taste of some alone time to be able to uh, do a little home recording. It was fun. How about yourself? How you doing? Myself, I am good. You know, this weekend there was nothing going on, which is exactly what I needed because I've been stressed out lately. So I, Tommy, I did something I I don't think I've ever done. What was that? I cleaned my whole apartment. Really? You've never? I'm talking every room on my hands and knees, cleaning the floors, cleaning behind boxes, cleaning behind the entertainment center, washing all the consoles, cleaning the television. Emptying out boxes I don't need, throwing stuff away, getting rid of old papers. I really went to town, and I cleaned every room in the apartment. How did you feel when you were done? I am walking around the apartment just looking at things, and I'm happy. I'm like, I can see why people do this every week. Oh, my God. It's my favorite part of the week. (laughs) Yeah. It's so much fun, and it's really when you're done and you look around and everything looks nice and the house smells nice and the floors are clean and things are organized, it gets just a very um, settling feeling. So I, I'm really glad you did that. That's awesome. It was great. Yeah, it was great. I I probably won't do it again for another year. You know, I everything's clean enough. Okay. You know, it's tidy. I, I kind of sweep up the floor when I see stuff. I'm really only in this room I'm in right now most of the time, so I keep this pretty clean, and the rest of the house is just, you know, whatever. I do the dishes, everything's fine, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll get more into cleaning. Who knows? But, you know, Tommy, life just feels fun again. I'm hanging out with people, and there's not a lot of stress, and there's not all the worry that I had last year and all the bad feelings. Life just feels kind of fun again, and I'm happy about that. And I realized... You know, if I wasn't putting all my time into these creative pursuits all the time, the podcast, the band, recovery, whatever else I'm doing, well, recovery is not a creative pursuit per se, but you know what I'm saying. If I wasn't putting energy into all these things, I think this, what I would just do normal stuff. Like I would clean the apartment and cook and organize things. And that's what I would do. And that would be fine. That's the stuff I let lapse because I'm busy with other stuff. Yeah, but I'm really glad you did that. That's a that's one of those things that uh, when I the house is totally clean, I have a feeling of contentment that I don't get normally. Also, this uh, newfound feeling of like feeling like life is going really well. Do you feel like? And this is just my perspective. Do you feel like it's connected to that? It's been a little bit nicer outside. That's part of it, but most of it is. Just letting go of a lot of baggage I was carrying around. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So once I let that go, I was just a lot happier and I can operate free in the world. But, oh, the weather thing is helping for sure. I'm actually really looking forward to spring. Oh, yeah. Oh, can I mention something else I did and I forgot to mention it? Yes. Super quick. When we went to go drop the girls off at my in-laws, we drove past the cemetery where my father and my uncle are buried. So... We stopped at a you know a uh, gas station and got some flowers and was able to spend like ten minutes at the cemetery. Just kind of, I always do like I go by myself. Like Kelly was in the car with me, but I always like you know, can you give me like five minutes? Because I literally I go out there and talk to them like they're there. So yeah, uh, I went out there and talked for a while, and my wife came out and she was like you know gave me a hug and we walked back to the car and I was like, oh my god. I forgot I had a a really uh, a very close friend from grade school who lost a son who was nine months old and he's buried like a hundred feet away from my dad. So I went over and grabbed two flowers from one from my dad's grave and one from my uncle's grave where they're buried next to each other and took them over and uh, went over and talked to my friend's son for a little bit. So that's nice. Yeah, I, I don't think I visited my brother's grave since. 2006 so i i would like to do that again at some point i could never do it with someone else there though it's like too much of a thing yeah i i that's why i always ask kelly like you can you can you stay back for a couple minutes just to give me like because you know usually i'll just i just sit down and just sit there and talk and uh you know she'll know when i'm done because i'll start kind of like walking back towards the car and she's like no i want to come like okay and stand there and just kind of spend some time and just pay our respects. But yeah, it was just definitely like, uh, it felt really good 
because I, I hadn't been there in, I don't know, six months or so. Um, and I feel like when I go there, I always talk and tell him what's happening. Like, Oh, I, you know, I interviewed for a new job and I'll, you know, I kind of just bring him up to date and I know it's, I know some people might think that's silly and a waste of time, but, uh, it really does. There's something extremely, like there's something extremely cathartic about it. Like I feel so much better when I'm leaving than when I drove in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I used to do the same thing. Yeah. You know, did you tell your dad that leaving says hello? I actually forgot about that. Oh, well, I'll, uh, You're going to have to do it next I was time. I say next time. Actually, next time I, I'll do what I also usually do, which is um, I'll get a, a one of those little pounder cans of uh, Guinness and I'll pour it out for him. <laughs> I, I usually bring one with me because I'm, it's usually like a planned thing. Like I know I'm driving past there. So I'm like, oh, I'll just go grab one of them at the, you know, whatever pizza place or whatever like that and grab a, a Guinness and pour it out for him. But, you know, I forgot this time. The gas station only had flowers. So sorry, daddy, no beer. <laughs> <laughs> Better luck next time. Well, folks, that's it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope you'll join us next week for another new episode and another new guest. So thanks everybody for listening and until next time. Yay!